Hi everybody, this is Mike Pock with Three Peaks Photography coming to you from a very cold and snowy Colorado Springs. In this video, I'm gonna teach you how to calculate equivalent exposures. This is the process of starting with a short exposure photograph and then going to a much longer exposure photograph and making sure you know how to change your settings in order to get the same exposure values between the two sets of photos. So why do we need to know this and when do we use it? It's really important to understand how to do this and how to change the settings on your camera when switching from short exposures to long exposures because we just don't want to waste the time. It, this takes the guesswork out of this process and if you know how to change your settings to create the same exposure value, uh, then you just have to do it once and then you just can continue shooting instead of taking one test shot after the other to try to figure out what you need to do. Uh, so some examples of when we use this, one would be, let's say you're using a six stop neutral density filter. When you put that filter on your lens to maybe get uh, exposures of water flowing through a creek or uh, clouds traversing across the sky, then you really want to be able to know how to calculate what settings you need to choose in your camera in order to get the proper exposure. The other examples of when we use this involve photographing the night sky. One would be, let's say you are using a tracker like the Move Shoot Move Tracker that I use, and you want to take some long exposures of the night sky uh, to get some really great shots with no movement in the stars. First, you're gonna start off with a much shorter exposure, and then you're going to figure out what your setting should be for that longer exposure time. And and you know, being able to calculate this helps you save time because then you're not fumbling around trying to guess what settings you need to choose. The other example involves star trails. Let's say you're photographing the night sky with the intent of capturing the stars as points of light. You're using much shorter exposure values, exposure times. Uh, then you decide you want to do some long star trails and the, these may be exposures that are 16, 32 minutes long and you definitely don't want to wait that long to figure out that you didn't get your settings dialed in properly. So this is really important for us to learn and to understand. We're going to get down to basics and talk about the concept of a stop of light what that means, and then how your camera settings control those stops of light. Then I'm gonna show you how to calculate the equivalent exposures when you're changing from short exposure times to long exposure times. So let's talk about this concept of a stop of light. You may have heard this term before. I think there's a lot of people that get into photography and they buy themselves a very nice camera they may read the manual, they may watch some YouTube videos, but I think a lot of people skip learning what a stop of light means, and all of your exposure controls are based on this concept. So getting down to this fundamental idea is something that's really important for you to understand what we're doing here with this process. So a stop of light is a relative term and it's an indication of how the amount of light in an exposure changes as compared to an initial amount of light. So let me explain with this example. Let's start with a single light bulb as our source of light. This is our base setting. This would be considered our zero exposure value. Okay, this is where we're starting off. In order to increase the amount of light by one stop, we need to double the amount of light by adding a second bulb of the same value. If we want to increase the amount of light by another stop, we need to double the amount of light again 
by adding two more bulbs of the same value as the original single bulb. If we start with a single bulb and we want to decrease the amount of light by one stop, we need to cut the amount of light in half. To decrease by another stop, we need to cut it in half again. So how does this relate to the exposure settings on my camera for aperture, shutter speed, and ISO? Allow me to explain. Let's say that we're photographing a nature scene such as this one. If we use the camera's meter to read the amount of available light while shooting in the program, shutter priority, or aperture priority modes, the exposure value scale, which you see below, will read zero or zero exposure value. This is when you push the shutter button down halfway, you activate the focus, you activate the camera's meter. If you're shooting in one of these three modes, then the camera is going to choose settings to adjust to this zero exposure value uh, position on your exposure scale. The camera considers this a proper exposure, but it might not be correct for your situation because the camera's meter wants to adjust everything to a medium gray tone, your image may end up being underexposed or overexposed if you rely on the camera to make these decisions for you. In order to, exchange, uh, to change the exposure when you're in one of these shooting modes, you can use the exposure compensation function to override the camera's meter and increase or decrease the exposure value. The example below shows the exposure scale in a position where you have increased the exposure by one stop or plus one EV. But how does this work when you shoot in manual mode? In manual mode, you can override your camera's meter and change your exposure by adjusting your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO independently of each other. But how do these settings relate to stops of light? Well, that's a great question. So every time you double your exposure time, you increase the amount of light coming into the camera by one stop, okay? If you can go back to the example of using the light bulb. So in this case, I've gone from one light bulb to two light bulbs, okay? I have doubled my uh, exposure time, doubled the amount of light coming into the camera. I've increased the exposure value by one stop of light. Cutting the exposure time in half decreases the exposure time by one stop. Every time you double your ISO, you increase the exposure by one stop. Cutting the ISO in half decreases the exposure by one stop. But what about those pesky aperture settings? This is where people get confused. Okay, so let me take the time to explain here. When adjusting your aperture, it's best to memorize the full stop increments as are listed below. That's f1.2, 1 1.4, 2.0, 2.8, f4, f5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22. Okay, this is where people get confused because they see a small number like say 2.8 and they think that that means it's a small aperture they see a large number like f16 and they think that's a big aperture well it's actually the opposite and the reason for that and if you're a math person this is easy for you to understand if you're not a math person it might be a little bit of a challenge for you and i understand uh, so what we're actually looking at is a fraction so this f number like here f22 this is actually F over 22. So the 22 is the denominator of this fraction. 
And if you understand fractions, you know that the larger the denominator, the smaller the overall value. So that's why this F22 is a small aperture and F2.8 is a big aperture. Okay, so when we have a small number as the denominator, the overall value is larger. Okay, so keep that in mind, but it's a good idea for you to, to memorize these full stop increments. Okay, now closing the aperture by one full increment cuts the amount of light entering the lens in half and decreases the exposure by, you guessed it, one stop. Opening the aperture by one full increment doubles the amount of light entering the lens and increases the exposure by one stop. But Mike, my lenses have aperture values in between the full stop values. What does this mean? Well, most cameras allow you to adjust your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO in one third stop increments. So if we look at these examples, um, aperture, let's say we start at f5.6, we have in between f5.6 and f8, which are the full stop increments, 6.3 and 7.1. Each of those positions represents one third of a stop of light. Shutter speed, let's say we're going from one one hundredth of a second to one two hundredth, two hundredth of a second. Those are our full stop increments. In between, we have one one twenty fifth and one one sixtieth. For ISO, let's just say we're gonna go from 200 to 400. Those are our full stop increments. In between, we have 250 and 320. Each of those positions represents one third of a stop of light, okay? Some cameras will allow you to choose one half stop increments, but it's generally advised to set up your camera to use one third stop increments because then you have more flexibility when it comes to adjusting your exposure, okay? And if it helps you, if you need to close down or open up by a stop, uh, you can just count by threes if you're going in between the full stop increments. Um, and that may make it easier for you to say, oh, okay, I need to adjust by one stop, then go you know, one click, two clicks, three clicks. That would be a full stop. So uh, familiarize yourself also with the one stop increment settings for uh, all of the exposure controls, the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Doing so will make your life much easier. But what about calculating equivalent exposures when going from a short exposure time to a long exposure time? That's what we're here for, that's what we wanna learn, right? So let's take a look at this example. Now, uh, this is one of the locations I use for my night sky workshops in West Cliff, Colorado, which is Colorado's first dark sky community and the world's highest in elevation. So in the picture on the left, I was intentionally shooting the sky, the stars as points of light. So there, there would be little to no movement in the stars in the Milky Way. And, um, I started with a 15 second exposure, and we're gonna talk about why that number is important. And it just so happened that the settings for aperture and ISO of F2.8 and, and 6400 gave me a good exposure, okay? Then I decided that I wanted to have some fun and shoot star trails, so, I went with a 32 minute exposure and figured out that the aperture and the ISO settings of F5.6 and 200 were what I needed to dial in in order to maintain my same exposure value compared to the first image, okay? 
So let's discuss this further. Let's take a look at the exposure times in this chart. In the left column, you see the time in seconds and each one of these values represents a full stop increment because I'm doubling the amount of exposure time. And in the column on the left, this is showing you the resulting increase in exposure by stops of light. Now, I started with 15 seconds. I recommend that you start with 15 or 30 seconds because it makes the math work out very easily, especially if you're doing this in your head. So I went from 15 to 30 to 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Each time I'm doubling the amount of time and you can see that I went from my zero exposure value, which is 15 seconds, and increased the exposure by seven stops by going to a 32 minute exposure. So uh, just to reiterate some of the things, when calculating the equivalent exposure, it's best to start at 15 or 30 seconds because doubling those times is easy to do in your head or you can count on your fingers. I, I actually do encourage you to count on your fingers, especially if you're out in the dark. It does make this process easier for you and there's no shame in, in using your fingers. So 15 or 30 seconds, you can start out there. It doesn't really matter if you have movement in your stars or not because you are in going to intentionally do star trails where you're going to have movement. So what we're really concerned at this point is getting a good exposure. So start at 15 seconds or 30 seconds, get your other settings dialed in for aperture and ISO to create the correct exposure for you, the exposure that you want. Now, if I start at a different exposure time, let's say 20 seconds, that's going to be much harder for me to do. So uh, especially if I'm doing it in my head, 20 seconds, double that is 40, double that is 80, double that is 160. I, I'm going to get lost. I'm going to get confused. So 15 and 30 seconds are my recommended starting points. Okay. Now I will tell you that you can use an app that has an equivalent exposure calculator on it to do this. However, I really like doing this in my head. I like giving my brain these exercises so that I can keep it sharp. And you know, also it's, it's a good um, uh, fail safe because if you can you know, figure out how to do this in your head, uh, then that's really great. You don't have to rely on another piece of technology. Let's say you rely on uh, photo pills and their calculator, and then your phone battery goes dead. Uh oh, what are you going to do now? Um, I don't want to stop shooting. I want to shoot star trails. So if I have it figured out or can figure it out in my head, I am much better off. Or, you know, maybe your app just flips out on you and it doesn't work. So it's always good to have these skills um, so that you don't have to rely on the technology. Now, again, in the example here, changing the exposure time from 15 seconds to 32 minutes represents a seven stop increase in exposure and that's plus seven EV, okay? So why did I end up at 32 seconds? It's be I'm sorry, 32 minutes. It's because of the way the numbers work out when I double the times, okay? So as you saw on the chart, um, one minute, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, 16 minutes, 32 minutes, those are all uh, doubled times, okay? Now, now that we've figured out how much of an increase an exposure we've introduced into this problem here, I now know that I have to compensate for that increase in exposure by reducing the exposure in the same amount uh, 
by changing my aperture and or my ISO. I can do a combination of both. I can choose one setting to change or the other setting, or I can do a combination of both. So I need to decrease my exposure by seven stops minus seven EV in order to maintain the same exposure value that I had in my original test shot. Okay, so let's take a look at this chart. This is a list of aperture settings in the column on the left. And then the column just to the right of that shows the uh, decrease in the exposure by stops of light. The next column over shows the ISO values. And then the column to the far right shows the decrease in exposure in stops of light for each of those full stop settings. So I went from 2.8 to 5.6, that is a two stop decrease in exposure. I'm closing down my aperture, letting in less light. Then I went from 6400 ISO all the way down to 200, and that represents a five stop decrease in exposure. Five plus two equals seven. Okay, so this is minus seven EV combined with the plus seven EV of the um, exposure increase, that gives me zero. So in this slide, I reiterate what I just said. In the example, the aperture and the ISO were changed as follows. Closing the aperture from 2.8 to 5.6, decreased my exposure by two stops or minus two EV. Reducing the ISO from 6400 to 200, decrease the exposure by five stops or minus five EV. The combination of these two equals a total decrease in exposure of seven stops. So two plus five is seven. That's minus seven EV in this case, plus seven EV for the increase in exposure time, minus seven EV equals zero. So I end up with the same exposure value as my original test shot, the one that's on the left, okay? So if we take a look at these two photos, you may say, well, Mike, the sky looks darker in the photo on the right. And I think that might be a little bit of an illusion because of what we're seeing in each image. But what I'm really concerned with here is the exposure on the windmill and the tank. I don't want the blades of the windmill to get blown out and overexposed. And if I look at the picture on the left and compare it to the picture on the right, these look exactly the same to me. Okay, so that is really important. So now you know how to do this. Practice with it. The more practice you get, the better you will be. This will become second nature to you the more you do it. I would also encourage you to get a calculator app like the one that's on PhotoPills. Figure it out in your head. Figure it out using the app. Hopefully they both match up. And then the more you practice, the easier it becomes. So that's it. I hope that you have fun out there shooting, calculating your equivalent exposures, and I would love to see you out here in Colorado sometime on one of my night sky workshops. So have fun and be safe.